Good evening, everybody, uh, especially Professor Andrea Poma and Jeffrey Barish. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you here with us at this international virtual colloquium on Neocantianism. We are very honored by your presence, uh, if in, even if it's a, a virtual presence. Your fame here precedes you uh, in Brazil. After all, you're, you are among the main references in Neocantianism studies, and uh, your works are part of any respectable bibliography in a research project. So today, uh, we have the precious opportunity for a direct dialogue with authors who have been our references for a long time. Uh, as we have already said in other sessions, <laughs> this initiative is part of a joint effort to renew and broaden the reception of neocantianism thought in Brazil, uh, which on this occasion involves four Brazilian universities and two research groups. For the session, we have also the presence of professors José Rezende, Fábio Abreu, and Evandro Brito. Evandro Brito, sorry. Uh, we will start today with Professor Jeffrey Barry's lecture, and uh, then we'll have Professor Palma's lecture. At the end of both talks, we will open up for questions among those present here in the virtual room and then in the audience. Now, I'll give a brief introduction of uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Indur Barish. Uh, he's Emeritus Professor of Philosophy uh, in the University of Picardy. He's Alumnus Fellow of the Society of Fellows in Humanities of the Columbia University, also Alumnus Fellow uh, at, uh, of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, uh, also in Jean Monnet Fellow for the uni European University Institute in Florence, uh, Ernest Cassia, visiting professor in Hamburg in 2002, uh, Lady Davis Fellow in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Gadamer Distinguished Visiting Professor, professor uh, in the Boston College, Max Planck Fellow in the University of Constance, member of the School of Historical Studies in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. He's also author, among other works, uh, of My Martin Heidegger and the Problem of Historical Meaning, Heidegger et son siècle, uh, which has a Portuguese translation, Heidegger e o seu século, tempo do ser e tempo da história. Also, uh, the symbolic construction of reality, the legacy of Ernest Cassir. Uh, Politique de l'histoire, l'historicisme comme promesse et comme mythe. Uh, collective memory and historical past, among other uh, works. Uh, today, Professor Barish will give us the lecture, uh, the, the, the history between science and art, Willem Windelband, and the dilemma of New Kantian theory of history. Professor Barish, you're very welcome. I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, since my... Um, paper has already been published in uh, Portuguese um, in your journal. It looks wonderful. And I thank you for including it. Um, I thought it would be more interesting perhaps if I approached the same subject from a different angle um, and try to illustrate how Wilhelm Windelband's uh, conception of history emerged in relation to Schopenhauer, both uh, in a very ambiguous relation to Schopenhauer, both as an appropriation of some of Schopenhauer's <coughs> fundamental concepts, but also a rejection of his critical attitude toward history. Um, you probably know that uh, Schopenhauer 
um, has different sections on history in the first part of the world as will and representation. But the most famous part that I will talk about today <clears throat> is in the second part, chapter 38, which is simply titled uh, On History, Über Geschichte. Um, this chapter had an enormous impact. This chapter, but all of the world as will and representation in Schopenhauer's other writings had a tremendous impact, uh, as is well known, on um, Germany and on Europe uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, I'll just give you two examples beside uh, Wittelband, who is a very attentive reader of Schopenhauer, and he commented on him a number of times in his uh, writings. Um, the first example is uh, Jakob Borchardt, the great contemporary of, um, <clears throat> of uh, Windelband, who lived in, in Basel. And many of uh, Borchardt's uh, attitudes toward philosophy and culture in the late uh, 18, 19th century um, are expressed in his correspondence, especially his letters to um, von Prehn, uh, and in 1870, uh, the very period of the uh, war uh, between Prussia and France, um, uh, Burkhardt wrote to von Prehn about Schopenhauer. He says, I quote him, uh, the change in the German spirit will be so great as that of the French spirit. He says, and he continues a few sentences later, also, the, the worth um, of the philosopher, and when he talks, Burkhardt talks about the philosopher, he means Schopenhauer. Uh, the worth, the value of the philosopher is going up uh, very steadily, while Hegel at the same time um, is going down. And in fact, it is time for Hegel to definit definitively um, go into um, uh, into retreat, into um, his uh, retirement. Um, so you have an idea of the Schopenhauer, of Burkhardt, who is very much influenced by Schopenhauer in many ways, especially what's called Schopenhauer's pessimism, even if he was very reserved about certain of um, Schopenhauer's uh, judgments about history. Another example, uh, there are many I could give, but I'll, the other example, which is probably the most famous um, is of course, um, Burkhardt's uh, contemporary and uh, friend, uh, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, you'll remember that uh, Nietzsche wrote the first of the untimely meditations, the one before history, where he adopts many of Schopenhauer's uh, critiques of historical knowledge and historiography. The, uh, the third, excuse me, of the untimely meditations after the essay on um, uh, history is called Schopenhauer as Educator. So there's a whole essay on Schopenhauer. Um, and you can just see the importance of Schopenhauer on Nietzsche's, the young Nietzsche's thought. Uh, I cite um, a, a short passage from Schopenhauer as Educator where he writes, it was thus truly roving through wishes to imagine I might discover a true philosopher as an educator who could raise me above my insufficiencies insofar as these originated in the age and teach me again to be simple and honest in thought and life. That is to say, to be untimely. That word understood in the profoundest sense. So we looked to Schopenhauer for a spirit of untimeliness, a very important point in, um, in Nietzsche's vocabulary. Um, I could go on about the influence that Schopenhauer had more implicit on historians like Doisen and others, but let me turn uh, to Schopenhauer's attitude toward history, just a few comments about it before uh, pointing out the ambiguity um, of Windelband toward Schopenhauer's thought, and which will highlight the problem of the relation between uh, art and history which comes out very clearly in this uh, ambivalence between them and therefore connects with the main topic of my paper. 
Um, I wanted to underline two aspects of Schopenhauer's uh, thoughts on history that come out in uh, chapter 38 of book two, two aspects that uh, would seem to be contradictory. This has often been said, I, for one example, among Schopenhauer's contemporaries, Kuno Fischer, the great neo-Kantian uh, historian of philosophy, uh, Kuno, and, uh, Kuno Fischer, who thought that the two sides of Schopenhauer's uh, argument were completely uh, contradictory, and uh, which I think is a very interesting. I think that they're not. I mean, I think that uh, there's one word at the end of the essay that Schopenhauer says that shows you how they can be reconciled. And I will end my short comments on Schopenhauer with, with that. So the first side of this um, ambiguity or this, uh, I must say, antinomy in Schopenhauer's relationship or his attitude toward history can be seen in his critique of historical knowledge, of histori historiography of his period. You'll see that in the very first uh, sentence, or first paragraph of his essay on history, he cites Aristotle. And he cites Aristotle's famous judgment about history um, in the Poetics, where um, Aristotle wrote that poetry is more philosophical and higher than history, for poetry tends to express the universal history, the particular. And Schopenhauer says that his comments on history are going to elaborate on this uh, negative judgment um, of Aristotle, who placed poetics and art more generally higher than uh, historical knowledge. Uh, and he says that this is simply because uh, history, historical events, historical uh, facts are infinite. They're completely individual. They are uh, in their reality, in their objective reality, they're completely ungraspable. Nobody can really understand uh, what history is in its objective reality. And so that uh, attempts to do this are, are simply fictive constructions. And um, this is where Schopenhauer um, draws an analogy between historical knowledge and art, uh, precisely because um, art too is concerned with uh, individuality, but it approaches individuality through the aesthetic idea raising it to, to a higher level, whereas history simply creeps along the ground, as Schopenhauer says, in res uh, restricting itself to individual events, uh, which always change, which are completely contingent, which never repeat themselves, and therefore cannot be made into a science, which requires uh, generalizations and um, systems in order to predict the future on the basis of the past, like the generalizing laws of uh, physics or uh, other natural sciences. History is unable to do this. And therefore, um, very much like Kant, he believed that uh, uh, there was little value in uh, talking about history as a science. It goes beyond Kant and his radicalism. Um, I cite a, a brief sentence of Schopenhauer, page 439, 440, in the second volume of the Dover edition, the translation of the world as a will and representation, where Schopenhauer writes, history lacks the fundamental characteristics of science. For nowhere does it know the particular by means of the universal, but it must comprehend the particular directly and can continue to creep along the ground of experience, so to speak. So um, he denied that history had any uh, scientific status, that historical knowledge concerned some objective reality beyond uh, the human knower. And this is why um, he was able to say one page later in his chapter on history, I quote him, history is therefore the more interesting, the more special it is, but also the less trustworthy and thus it approximates in all respects to a work of fiction. We see that for Schopenhauer, there's, uh, because there's no grounding in objective reality, uh, given the uh, infinite individuality of historical facts and events, therefore the constructs of uh, the historian are simply um, 
fictive. Um, so I think that this is a very important point. Also the point that for him, human nature, um, the human essence, as he called it, that's mentioning of the Asian, is everywhere the same. Uh, what changes is the outer appearances, and but uh, ultimately um, the inner motives and the inner inner springs of action don't change in over time. They are they are the same, and and so it's not necessary. Um, the historical knowledge of uh, the claims to be grounded in objective fact, uh, in fact. Um, um, is not necessary to um, know the human essence. And art uh, has a better access to it because it raises it to the universal and to the idea, as he calls it, um, which history cannot do in the same way. On this basis, of course, he criticizes Hegel. I mean, Hegel was his great enemy. It's known that they were they held their classes at the same time at the University of Berlin. Hegel was the great philosopher with tremendous audiences. Schopenhauer had six or seven students in each lecture. And uh, at the time, he was not at all appreciated. And he had great uh, resentment against Hegel for many reasons. But he also, on intellectual grounds, um, thought that um, his uh, philosophy of history, as he called it, was a mythology. It's a mythological construction, uh, as he says. Uh, so I think that this is um, a very important, this is the first part of the essay. And so now I turn to the second part of the essay. Uh, the second part of the essay, um, in, in which he seems to contradict what he says, because he says that history does have a value. And the value of history is precisely in that nations know can know and remember their own past. And if they don't um, know their own past, they have a, a lack of self-consciousness, as he calls it. Uh, I quote him on page 445, where he talks about uh, the, the, the value of history, where he says that only through history does a nation become completely conscious of itself. Accordingly, history is to be regarded as rational self-consciousness of the human race. It is to the race with the reflected and connected consciousness conditioned by the faculty of reason is to the individual. So this is a very odd um, way after debunking and criticizing the objectivity and the reality of any knowledge of the historical past. He then in the second part talks about the value of a nation knowing uh, its own past and how this uh, is central to its self-awareness, its self-consciousness. But I think that if you look closely at the concluding argument that he presents, you can see that um, he, he actually resolves the paradox because at one point he says the true value of history, um, the universal and predominant interest uh, rests mainly on its being a personal concern of the human race. Eine persönliche Angelegenheit. It's a personal concern of the human race. I think this idea that, therefore, uh, it doesn't have to be grounded in any kind of objective being or reality. It doesn't have to have any claim to having objective worth, and, uh, having some reality in an ongoing existence of the past. What's important is that it's the subjective value, the personal um, uh, concern uh, for the past has a value for the, the, the will, uh, for um, individual self-knowledge in general. So that it's a, it's a paradoxical idea that comes out in Schopenhauer, uh, but I, I think it's not entirely contradictory. Uh, what is clear is that given its individuality and its infinite individuality, events and facts uh, have no ground in um, objective being and therefore no claim to a scientific uh, reality, scientific status. So let's turn to Windelband um, and Windelband's appropriation of Schopenhauer. It's a really very interesting, his attitude toward Schopenhauer. Um, he cites him at 
num numerous places in his works, namely uh, in um, his famous rectoral address presented at the University of Strasbourg, um, which is called History and Natural Science, where he justifies and attempts to ground the theory of, uh, of, of, of history, historical knowledge as scientific knowledge against Schopenhauer, while appropriating and accepting Schopenhauer's judgment that history ultimately has to do with an infinite manifold um, of uh, facts, of individual singular facts. Um, this is a very uh, central point. Um, and he goes so far in this uh, rectoral address uh, presented in, in Strasbourg, uh, which is in the first volume of Preludian, as I mentioned in my, um, in my paper, um, he goes so far as to agreeing not only with Schopenhauer's qualification of history um, as dealing with individual facts, which are infinite in their uh, variety and singularity, but for that very reason, he reaffirms Schopenhauer's claim that history is like art, that like art, history has to do with um, individuality. And nonetheless, in spite of these two elements of Schopenhauer's theory of history that Windelbahn acknowledges and accepts, nonetheless, in the um, uh, rectoral address, History in Natural Science, Schopenhauer explicitly names Schopenhauer, he explicitly mentions Schopenhauer, and says that um, although he's right in claiming that history deals with individual singular events and facts, um, it is not for that reason unscientific. It can be systematized and made into a, a science. So it's this idea of science, history is a science that I analyze in some, in some detail uh, in my paper and its departure from, um, from Kantian, uh, Kantian uh, criticism, critical theory. Um, a few words could be said about that. In other words, uh, the question we, I ask is, uh, well, what makes it possible to systematize history as a science? And the reason is for um, Windelbahn is that uh, like natural science, history deals with concepts. Um, it's not simply a, uh, an attempt to systematize an infinity of individual facts for their own sake. And not, not all facts have the same status. It's not because they're individual, but all facts. The example he gives is Goethe. He says, well, one day uh, Goethe may have dropped a letter into the letterbox. And we have a record of it that he talks about it in um, one of his discussions with um, Eckerman. I was walking down the street and I dropped a letter in the letterbox. This had absolutely no historical interest at all. So it's a singular event for sure. And there are an infinite number of um, individual events, uh, but um, most of these events have absolutely no historical interest. So the question is, um, what is it that makes a uh, historical fact, a singular historical fact interesting and of concern to the historian? And what makes it possible to, cl make, to claim not only that it's of an interest, and therefore a persönliche Angelegenheit, a personal concern, but is anchored in a, uh, an objective reality? The answer that Windelbahn gives, the famous answer that I deal with in my paper, is that it's precisely because um, um, history deals, the concept formation of history is on the basis of values, of singular values. It's because the uh, historian values something in the past, that uh, singular values that the historian is able to um, choose among an infinite manual, manifold of facts, those facts in the past which are relevant and uh, that have um, uh, a, a, a true meaning of, and he, he goes so far as to say yes and this is not only uh, this is a true meaning also not simply it doesn't restrict history to the status of an art but it raises to the level of a science precisely because uh, these values are grounded in a an overarching historical continuity 
an overarching historical tradition. He writes an essay on tradition in the Preludium. Um, and it's this continuity, this tradition, this cohesion, Susamanhang, of the different values over time, uh, their development and their, um, the way in which they uh, progress. He uses the idea of progress because the different mistakes, uh, even in natural science, they correct themselves over time and the pursuit of truth becomes ever more refined over the course of history. And this is because uh, the values uh, are not simply subjective whims that change uh, arbitrarily over time, but because they are anchored in a larger cohesion, an objective cohesion that guides or that um, overreaches, overgirds the historical process as a whole. And so this is, we see that this tends toward a kind of a, um, a teleological, he doesn't like the word metaphysics and he rejects it, but he accepts the Kantian vision of a, a teleological unity of the historical process. It's teleological in the sense that you can't see it in operating in empirical reality itself, but it's something that uh, you can ideally presuppose. Uh, it's legitimate to ideally presuppose. It's this cohesion over time. Um, it's this ability to presuppose that the values that I apply in lending meaning to the facts of the past in, in their individuality and choosing among those facts, those that are meaningful as opposed to those that are not, uh, which makes it possible to claim that um, history has a, a, a real and objective meaning. Um, there's much to be said about this, uh, um, but I would like simply to um, underline one aspect of this, the aspect that is so um, sharply criticized um, in the period after the First World War, I deal with this at some length in my book, uh, Martin Heidegger and the Problem of Historical Meaning, where uh, the first part of the book uh, deals with the development, the emergence of a problem of, of historical meaning after Hegel, uh, and precisely in this neo-Kantian context, the context of the neo-Kantians in Diltai, um, how it is that um, the problem of historical meaning emerges in this period. Um, the way in which Windelband, Windelband is very uh, aware of this, he's constantly criticizing the idea of what he calls relativism or histori historism or historicism, uh, historismus, um, which is in the prelude, and there are many points at which he says, you know, it's precisely our idea of transcendent values that overgird the historical process as a whole. Um, that makes it possible for us to escape from uh, relativism, from historicism, which would uh, claim that the values are radically changing and that there is therefore no theoretical uh, cohesion, no theoretical continuity, uh, and no value to tradition itself. Um, and so Vindelbahn goes so far, and Rickert after him, uh, his student and uh, disciple and uh, the uh, philosopher who really systematized uh, this idea of historical science beyond uh, Windelband in the period before the First World War. Um, the word that he uses is uh, the idea of transcendence. There are transcendent values. And so you see that he's going beyond Kant toward uh, a clear uh, Platonism. And uh, he writes an essay on Plato, by the way, in the uh, Preludium. It's not an accident that Plato, he, he goes back to the Kantian roots, uh, or the pl Platonic roots of, of Kant. And you remember that when Kant, uh, in the Critique of Pure Reason, where in the, um, the beginning of the Transcendental Dialectic, where he, the first passage is on the ideas, and he defines what the ideas are, he says that he wants to, not to give a metaphysical um, status to um, uh, to ideas, but nonetheless he wants to um, give them a, a value that has been uh, denied by modern philosophy as a whole. He wants to renew a, 
a certain tendency of, uh, of, of the Platonic philosophy. He says this explicitly, although in a critical perspective, without the metaphysical, the heavy metaphysical uh, basis. And so Wittelbaum is very much faithful to Kant uh, in this way. Uh, after breaking uh, with Kant's refusal to um, acknowledge history as a science, the possibility of uh, making history into a science in the same way as uh, the natural sciences. Nonetheless, he's willing to uh, acknowledge uh, the platonic, goes even beyond uh, Kant, I think, in, in saying that it's because there are these transcendent values beyond um, uh, the empirical field that can't be ascertained in empirical history itself, but which can be ideally presupposed uh, by the historian as the ultimate basis of historical science. I point out in my book on Heidegger that in Heidegger's early lectures in the 1920s, I think, for example, of his introduction to the phenomenology of religion, where is, there are long passages on Wittelband and on Rickert in which he points out this uh, Platonism, this Platonic element in their philosophy, which he says we have to deconstruct. We have this is the part of uh, philosophy that we can no longer acknowledge. It's a very important critique uh, and shows a kind of a watershed after the First World War, where this idea of uh, an overarching cohesion of the historical process no longer seems plausible to uh, most philosophers, and Heidegger's critique being the most radical uh, expression of it. Um, I have spoken already for nearly 40 minutes. I will simply conclude and conclude with the uh, conclusion of my paper itself. Uh, because I think that, um, that Windelband is very important. Uh, and I think the relation between Schopenhauer and uh, Windelband is also very important, uh, precisely because of this idea um, This idea, this idea that, um, um, one second. Oui, je suis dans la conférence. Je suis dans la conférence. Okay, ciao. Um, with my wife. <laughs> um, the, and so I think that um, the, ultimate problem is the problem of this assumption that historical reality is, is this nominalistic assumption shared by Schopenhauer and Windelband that empirical reality is ultimately um, completely individual and completely unfathomable. That this reality uh, is completely, um, is not something that we have any um, meaningful re relationship with. And I think that the way I end my uh, um, paper is I think the uh, really important uh, reason for um, dealing with Wintelbahn's uh, thought, with neo kantianism generally, is precisely because of, of this assumption and because of the um, way in which Diltai, I think Diltai for me is a, a great source of, um, um, of inspiration, uh, Diltai's great essay on our conviction on the reality of an external world, uh, the famous essay, uh, in which he goes against precisely this, this neo-Kantian assumption of his times. Um, it's an essay that Heidegger would uh, praise and that he would refer to and that uh, had a great importance throughout the, um, uh, the 1920s and 30s. If you look at uh, Helmut Plessner, for example, the, the, this philosophical anthropology, it takes off from, from this idea of Diltai. This idea, uh, which I myself uh, find extremely important, um, is the idea that, in fact, uh, there is a reality to the historical past. It's a reality um, that comes to expression in the latency, the ongoing meaningfulness and the latency of, of symbols, uh, of the symbolic embodiment of experience as memory. 
uh, which I deal with in my book, Collective Memory and the Historical Past. And this, I think that Bill Tai gives some very, very good indication because what he says in this essay, and I think this is why it's important. Unfortunately, it's extremely brief. There are only two pages on it. But what he says is extremely important because he said, when he talks about the outer world, the Außenwelt, what he's talking about is not simply external objects that we touch. Um, it's not physical objects, but it's also the historical past. This external reality is a reality that, that persists, that continues to live in us, uh, even if in only latent form, many times in latent form, through, and I would say through language, through symbols, um, I think that we can integrate this also into, into Kassir's wonderful idea of um, symbolic pregnancy, symbolische pregnancy, which I think is one of the great insights um, in which uh, you can, um, basis phenomena, uh, symbolic pregnancy, where it's precisely this insight of a, um, a reality that is not simply uh, in it, an individuality that is, has no sense on, in its own terms, but the idea of sim, symbolic um, symbolic incarnations uh, of, of experience that continue to live in us and that continue to be uh, points of orientation for the present, even beyond what we know in awareness. And so the role of the historian becomes extremely important. The role of the historian has to do with making explicit precisely those symbolic embodiments that are implicit um, and that we don't know. Um, and the proof of this, this is the way I end my paper uh, and I will end my talk on this note. Uh, the proof of this is precisely that in our confrontation with the past, uh, what we can confront is precisely something, not simply a continuity in Bindelbund sense, but also a radical alterity, a radical difference between the, the past and the present, uh, a radical difference that makes it in many cases very difficult to know the past, but nonetheless that can persist, that can continue beyond our explicit knowledge of it, and that can, when we begin to think about it, becomes very bothersome. Dilti already saw this. It can, be, it can bother, it can, it can reaffirm and can uh, lead us encourage us in our present action, but it can also be a source of great bother. And so I think that um, it's extremely important to uh, bring out this uh, latency of symbolic uh, embodiments of the past. Um, and uh, this is where my work on collective um, memory uh, begins. So I would like to thank you very much for your invitation. I hope that my talk was clear to you. Um, and uh, it was a great pleasure to have this opportunity to, to speak to you and before you. Thank you very much, Professor Barish. It was very nice to hear you uh, today. And uh, so I'll, I'm going to to give a brief presentation of Professor Pomo. Um, yes, here. Uh, so Professor Andrea Poma was assistant professor at the University of Turin, then associate professor of philosophy of religion at the University of Macerata, of philosophy of history at the University of Rome, and of moral philosophy at the University of Turin. He was also chairman of the Department of Philosophical Hermeneutics at the University of Turin and member of the Societa Italiana di Studi Cantiani of the Hermann Cohen Gesellschaft and Hermann Cohen Academy uh, of Phronesis, Associazione Italiana per la Consulenza Filosofica and other associations. Uh, Professor Poma is uh, author, among other works, of uh, The Critical Philosophy of Herman Cohen, Yearning for Form and Other Essays on Herman Cohen's Thought, and The Impossibility and Necessity of Theodicy, The Essays of Leibniz. Uh, so, 
Today, Professor Pomo will give us the lecture Monotheism and Philosophy, Brief Reflection from a Lecture by Herman Cohen. Professor Poma, you're very welcome, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good? Yes, very well. Oh. So, I, I don't will... I don't really read all the text of my paper because it is, it is published in the review. I would only uh, uh, st uh, stay on some points from Cohen of Cohen thought that are, in my opinion, very important also for our today situation in the postmodernism in 1914 i wrote a book uh, cadenzas about uh, where i proposed uh, a philosophical program for the postmodernity uh, alternative to the program of the french Philosophers as Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Gattari, and others, I say this was a Dionysian thought, and I propose an alternative, a radical alternative program as a lyric thought. And I find that some points in Cohen thought are very important for also for these also for this uh, perspective, and they were for me fundamental for my for my for developing of my of my reflections. So in my paper, I started from a surprising sentence from of Cohen in a lecture of 1907. I quote: "In, re in recent times, however." An aversion to religion has increased in cultural formation circles due to distrust and lack of modesty towards philosophy. So that is surprising because it's, it's very different from the traditional point of view of a conflict between uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, on the contrary, Cohen say that the the crisis the crisis of religion depends from a crisis of philosophy. What what he means? He means that religion and faith also uh, needed uh, uh, of philosophy for his for her theology theological doctrines. And on the other hand, philosophy and sciences too needed of the idea of God for the foundation of, uh, uh, of their cultural system. He says, I quote, since as in all religious moments, not least for us, the real and very difficult of our religious situation lies about the difference in the cultural conception of the world. And there should be no doubt for any man or culture that only philosophy is able to give a different view of the world because it is capable of founding it. But on the other end, it says also that we, uh, the philosophy and the sciences that refuses, refuse the idea of God. They have no more a foundation of their, of their thinking and of their research. So what is this fa religious foundation? This religious foundation is the idea of God. The idea of God, uh, of God is the idea of uniqueness. Oh God. This is the point of the monotheism. 
of the Jewish monotheism for corn, but in general of the monotheism. The uniqueness of God uh, is the, the foundation of the possibility of the possibility of ethics. It is not the foundation of ethics, but the foundation of the possibility of ethics. Also, in Cohen, there is no, there is no uh, reduction of the, of the faith to the ethics or of the religion to the ethics. There is no. The idea of God is no an ethics principle. Uh, in the ethic design and villains, the idea of God has no the the goal to found to found the, the, the ethics. It appears only at the end of the argumentation to gar as a guarantee of the unity in 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 infinity of the unity between to be and the how to be. As, as, as it is the same in Kant, eh? in the critical practical reason, the idea of God has no uh, space in the foundation of the ethics, only as guarantee for the summum bonum, for the highest good. Uh, so, uh, this is an important question uh, that philosophy and uh, monotheistic religion has have uh, together. The difference between to be and between and the ought to be. This difference must be maintained. The, uh, the, the principal error of the uh, absolute idealism of Schelling, uh, of Schelling and Hegel and of also of Fichte in, in a part of his philosophy is to unify, to identify to be and how to be. The difference, the ontological, the critical difference between to be and how to be is for Cohen a fundamental uh, principle. Cohen in the Ethic Design and Willen says, um, speaks first about this difference. O to be is different from to be and remains different from to be. Second, that doesn't signify that to ought to be is not. So Cohen speak about the the uh, the be of the ought to be, because ought to be is at the same ontological level as to be, and these two uh, points to, uh, together the difference and the same plane are very important for Cohen thought. I tried to develop this idea in the third moment that is not explicitly, explicit, explicitly expressed by Cohen, but in fact is in his thought. O to be is different to be from to be, but O to be is, is only in to be, in interior of to be. That we cannot find in, in Cohen as explicit theory, but in fact is the sense of his idea, of his theme of the humor. The humor is actually this reality of the how to be in the be, in the, in the factual reality. Uh, this is very important because this is the principle of the critic. The critic is the ought to be that lay, live in the being and living in the being, criticize the being any, any, uh, any day, any hour, 
ever. This is the first point. The second point is that is that Cohen uh, uh, confront, uh, make a confrontation between uh, religion and philo uh, also the Jewish tradition and philosophy, that is the Greek tradition. He says the Greek tradition uh, made the philosophy and the sciences, and the Jewish tradition had no science. The science and the philosophy in the Jewish tradition is a importation from the Greek tradition. Because the faith, the uh, religious uh, thought, is another way as the philosophical or scientific way. But these two different ways as a uh, one element, uh, one common element. They are two way of the universal reason. The religion as the, the philosophy and the science is a way of the universal reason. And so we come to the second point, the messianism. Messianism is the second postulate, uh, right, uh, Cohen, the second uh, point, high point of his uh, of his uh, uh, of his lesson. Messianism is a messianism without a messias, uh, says someone. Someone. It, it is in Cohen. It is so. Messianism mm -hmm. is an idea. Is not a person. Is an idea. The idea of the universal humanity. Uh, uh, God is not God of a people, is not God of a state, is God of the humanity. And Jewish people has a, a, go, a goal to testimony, testify in the uh, general, in the uh, universal culture, this universality of the idea of God. Uh, there is a point very, very interesting where Cohen says, yeah, I quote, the only God cannot be the God of a state. He can only be the God of men gathered in morality. This one God is what we must bring to true recognition in the world. That is our task in world history. If we didn't or didn't have that mission or didn't have it anymore, they ret then retaining our lineage would no longer have any Hebrew meaning. Well, he says, you understand, he says we, the Jews, when we don't have more, this, uh, non don't have longer, this mission to testify the universal sense of the unique God, our existence had no more Hebrew, Hebrew sense, Hebrew sense. This is very interesting. Also, this idea of the universal humanity is the principal idea of the humanism. And humanism is another character of, of Cohen's thought, and it is another character uh, about what we difference the different pro, uh, philosophical proposal in postmodernity, because the Dionysiac thought, the Leus, Foucault, and the others, they are philosophers of a uh, radical anti-humanistic thought that come from Nietzsche, from Schopenhauer, from Nietzsche, from structuralism, from Freud, and, and, so, and so other. I, I think uh, as a, a lyric thought, 
as a radical rationalistic and humanistic proposal for the postmodernity. And this humanism has his, uh, has his inspiration in this concept of Cohen, the mechanism of the, uh, as the idea of the universal humanity. And the uh, humanity is not a, a biological definition or an existential definition. Humanity is, is not a substantive, it is a, an attribute. Hum, human and no human, that is the theme, not what is the man. We don't know what is the man. We will work, we, we work to, to become the man. The man is who uh, can realize ever more, ever more the humanity, the humanness, human act, uh, li life, and they oppose to the unhuman, anti-human life. This is a very important point in my in my opinion of inspiration from Cohen thought. Third point is the, the, the difference between sacred and saint. Because uh, all the Cohen uh, interpretation of the Jewish tradition is in the sense of the ethics action, of the ethic realization of the good, ethic uh, and politics and and artistic also and so on. But saint is not the same as sacred. Uh, in uh, in English, or in German. Uh, there is the same word for saint and sacred. Uh, but this is a very ambiguous because the saint is the opposite of the sacred. The monotheism is the history, the, the true millennial history of the, of the battle against the sacred. Against the sacred. All the development of the interpretation of the sacrifice is a desacralization of the sacrifice. When in, uh, in, when in Bereshit uh, is, 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 uh, is, is wrote, he made the sun and the moon as two lamp in, in, the, in, the, in the sky. Also, the, the sun and the moon were God in the other cultures uh, where uh, the Hebrew live, uh, were living. And the author of, uh, of Bereshit said there are, they are only lamp, only light, artificial light. So that is a desacralization and we can make more and more examples. Sacred and saint are co uh, completely different, different way to to th to think and to feel and to live, because also also in the in the conception in the living the time, in in uh, in the theology of the later uh, uh, decades of the 20th uh, century, there was a, a, a very general doctrine about the difference between the mythos time and the Christian time. Mythos time is a circle and, and Christi Christian or monotheistic time is a line. But it's false. In my opinion, it's false, because the time for the sacred is a circle, yes, 
but the circle is only the model of the natural time, natural time. The natural time is the circle. But what is important for the sacred, for the for the conce sacred conception of time is not the circle, but the break in the circle. It is a circle, but there is a break in this circle. This moment at the at the end of the year and before the beginning of the new year. This is a break in the circle. This is the important for the sacred because the sacred is the conception of the of the existence uh, with the categories of pure impure. And pure impure are not contrary. Pure impure are not contrary, not opposite. What is pure is also impure. The uh, we can make uh, uh, makes many many examples. So the pure impure cannot be pardoned. Mu must be washed. Must be purified. And pur purification is this zero of existence. This break into the circle of the time. In this break. We, uh, they made or make a fast, a great fast. All the all the rules are suspended. All the differences between man and woman, between uh, 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 rich and poor, uh, and poor, between and so all are suspended. All is chaos, and then begins a new order, and. Uh, all the individuals begin a new order and they are they begin a new purity this is the only way for the sacred but the saint is another conception then the saint is on uh, uh, under under the, the category of good and evil is the ethics and uh, the time of the saint is not a linear, is not a circular, is not a linear, is a, a an expansive, is a, is a is a plane with many infinite directions, possibilities, choices, and this the the, the time and the space of the ethics of the saint, and you can and you can and you must also decide between good and Evil. I learn to you what is good and evil, say the God. Hmm? Uh, uh, so the difference uh, is that good, when uh, enter in the contact with the evil, can can uh, save the evil. On the contrary, in the in the uh, sacred perspective. When the pure enter in contact with the impure, is the impure that that's in that's, uh, transforms the pure. So uh, the saint is the space and the time of the ethics, and in this space and this time, the humor is fundamental because uh, ethics is the is the conception. Uh, that in every moment of your individual or common or social or general or universal life, you can begin a new, a good way. The past is the past, but from every point of from every point of your situation, you can be or begin to be virtuous, to be moral, to go in the good direction. This is what is impossible in the sacred conception of the existence. And this is very important also for our postmodern post post time, because our postmodern time is a new, uh, deep, sacral, 
culture. And the most important representant of the soccer culture in the in the Occidental, but also in the Oriental tradition or the, or the Middle Oriental tradition is the Gnosis. The Gnosis is the uh, real, really the alternative to monotheism. Not the atheist, but the Gnosis. And the Gnosis is the, the tri triumph of the sacred. And our postmodern uh, culture and society is a society without God, without, the words are not important, but deep sacred, deep sacred. And we, when we don't understand this, we don't understand the possibilities of the monotheism in this, in this society, the critical possibility of the monotheism in this society. Uh, I meet my students, I analyzed uh, some somewhere, some way, some way, the 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 fest in the discotheques and the dancing. They are the same as the fest at the at the beginning of the year in the all the sacred cultures. Light, dark light, um, uh, obsessive music drugs, and then all begins anew. Uh, so this point, uh, uniqueness of God, the, the how to be in the, in the being, as a critical point of the being, the humanism, the rationalism, and the, uh, the, the, the humor, of course, and this, uh, this opposition, critical opposition of the saint, that's a, of the ethics against the sacred. These are, for me, very important points in this conference of Cohen, but also in general in Cohen South. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Professor Promo, for this very interesting talk. Uh, so we, we'll have, we already have some questions from the audience, but uh, we will begin with uh, José Rezende, is that right? Uh, please, uh, give the floor. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon from Brazil. Um, Initially, I would like to thank the invitation to the, uh, of the colloquium coordination to participate in this session. And of course, uh, to congratulate Professor Jeffrey Parrish and Professor Andrea Poma for their brilliance and provoking lectures. Uh, I'd like to, to ask a question to Professor Parrish. Uh, my question is simple, uh, but I think it's uh, important for me, uh, intrigues me. Uh, my question is about uh, perhaps the types of values and Winderbahn thought about histo historical knowledge. Uh, is it possible to say that Winderbahn's dilemma dilemma that you uh, point in your presentation, uh, is it possible to say that Windelband's dilemma regarding the scientificity of historical concepts lies in the incompatibility of trying to coordinate two types of values? What I mean, uh, on the one hand, Windelband talks about the empirical values which are which are recognized positively or negatively uh, by human communities from the past guiding their collective action in order to produce the singularity of cultural goods or cultural phenomena it would be these values that the, histo the historian as a scientist should identify uh, in order to produce 
scientifically consistent uh, historical concepts. On the other hand, uh, to make this composition of historical concepts possible, the neo-Kantians, uh, Winderband and later uh, Hickert, would need to postulate absolute and unhistorical values in order to ensure a cohesion uh, throughout history. Uh, in short, in short, my question is, is it possible to say that Winderband and Hickett work with two types of values, empirical and historical values on the one hand, and absolute and unhistorical values on the other hand. Or we can say that empirical values uh, are just the way that absolute values are realized in cultural goods or phenomena. Uh, uh, is this? Uh, I don't know if, uh, if I could express exactly the idea, but if you can make some comments i appreciate i appreciate thank you okay thank you very much for a question it's a very interesting question <clears throat> um in fact there are three kinds of values and i think that that's um this comes out in a very important publication uh, that you may be familiar with um it's a uh, festschrift that was written uh for kuno fisher um and it was published in um 1907, and it's called Philosophy in the Beginning of the 20th Century. The Philosophie begin the 20th century. And both Windelband and Rickert contributed to it. Rickert wrote a very important essay, which is called The Philosophy of History, Geschichte Philosophie. And Windelband uh, wrote two essays for it, the last of which is particularly important, in which he explains why the history of philosophy is important and has a legitimate claim to being philosophical and not just historical. It's a very important point. Um, and so I think that the answer to the question is, is given there. Um, first of all, in talking about values, you, you talked about empirical. Uh, it's important to make a distinction. Windelbaum makes this distinction and Rickert um, has a very important long analysis of the difference between what both of them called um, practical uh, value judgments and theoretical relation to values. The difference is very simple. Um, in other words, a, a practical uh, value judgment is when I say, if I talk about Napoleon, and I say, oh, Napoleon was a dictator and you know I, I criticize him and and make a value judgment about his heritage. And that has to be distinguished from uh, what they call um, theoretische Wertbeziehung, a, a theoretical relation to values, which means that I suspend all value judgments and I simply try to understand what Napoleon's values were, what the values of the period of Napoleon were and how those values were incorporated into institutions and um, different uh, political, uh, artistic, and other cultural structures of the period. And so you have the, the, this very important distinction. And in fact, it's the theoretische Verbeziehung, the theoretical relation to values, which makes it possible to talk about an objective relation to the past. You know, objectivity is, is based not in um, theoretische uh, practice of Bertolt. It's not value judgments, uh, but rather an ability to stand back and see what values in the past that may be very different from ours, um, in fact, guided the actions uh, of historical figures in the past. So those are the two important values for empirical investigation in the sciences. Um, on the other hand, as you very correctly say, and this both Rickard and Bindelbund go into in their contributions to the special group for Kuno Fisher, um, they go into it in other places, but it's particularly clear in these two essays, um, which is to say that there is an um, overarching 
um, val structure of values, um, which in, in fact is uh, like like the Platonic uh, system, really. Um, you're right in saying that it's not. Um, it, they are. It's it's something that is unchanging. It's a ultimate uh, idea of justice, for example, uh, is not something that changes. It's something that is intrinsically just, intrinsically good. It's not something that, that changes, but the ultimate essence of the good is not something that we have empirical knowledge of, but it exists. We have to presuppose its existence beyond uh, the sphere of our empirical reality. So uh, this is extremely important. And uh, the importance is also the the idea that these um, transcendent values, um, if they are not, cannot be seen or touched or uh, uh, understood in their empirical manifestation, nonetheless, um, in the uh, progression of the sciences, in the progression of culture in, in general, uh, from metaphysical to a critical uh, way, to a scientific theoretical uh, outlook, such kinds of progression are manifestations of a, a kind of unifying principle of ra rationality that, um, that founds all of the different uh, manifestations of theoretical values throughout human history. So that um, it's, it's, it's platonic also has a kind of a neoplatonic idea of emanation uh, that goes back to Plotinus uh, there's a, a Fichtean uh, element in it as well. So I, th I think that, that the question of values is a complex one, but very, very important, very interesting um, in the way that both of them develop it. Of course, Rickert develops it at great length um, in his book, um, Die Grenzen der Naturwissenschaftlichen Begriffsbildung, the, the limits of the formation of concepts in the natural sciences, which is a, really a classic work. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lucas, what do you say? We, we, we keep with uh, Professor Barish or, or we turn to Professor Poma to, to the questions of here, the, the participants? Sure, Paul, but if you wanted to already put her things on that. Yeah. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, we, we have a we have a very good question here. Uh, so so I'll keep it to to Professor Barish. Uh, I'll read the question, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for the the conference. I have a question for Professor Barish. In Windelband's latest book, Introduction to Philosophy, the treatment of the problems of the philosophy of history is framed within a practical philosophy and not only as a discussion of historical knowledge. How would you understand this situation? Does this practical view depend on the notion of ideographic sciences? Would there be ethical presuppositions in the conception of historical knowledge? Or would they be independent ways of approaching history? This is a question of our colleague, uh, Jacinto Pais. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, there, uh, Bindelbahn is very much influenced by Kant. And he adopts the Kantian language and the Kantian distinction between what is and what should be, the famous Sein und Zollen. Um, and precisely this idea of Zola and what should be, uh, which is this ideal um, uh, duty or um, this ideal ethical principle is something that he totally um, believed in and uh, thought that this was the core of the Kantian ethical system that had uh, great bearing on, um, on um, on uh, historical knowledge in general. In other words, there is an ethical dimension to historical knowledge. Um, the fact of being uh, faithful to the past, the fact of uh, striving for objective theoretical truth is not simply a, um, only a, theor a theoretical interest. It also has an ethical uh, dimension to it. Um, 
He doesn't go into that a great deal, but he definitely says it in the Preludium. There are several uh, points at which he uh, refers to this ethical dimension of, um, of historical knowledge. Thank you very much. So, uh, I didn't know, I, I don't know. May I ask a question of uh, Professor Poma? Yes, I was of course. Okay. Uh, I was extremely interested in um, several aspects of your talk, especially the way in which you portray the um, the close connection between philosophy and religion. It's something that uh, is, I think, very difficult in Cohen, but extremely important. And I thought that you presented it very clearly. What really interested me was also what you say about the Messiah, the idea that the Messiah is not, is not a person who's going to you know, come back, but rather the Messiah has to be thought of as an idea, an idea of, uh, of humanity. It's, uh, it's a really uh, a very interesting, uh, a very very interesting concept. And um, do you are you referring essentially which which writings of Cohen are you referring to especially in talking about that? Are you talking are you referring to the religion of reason? Is it in in that context? I know that in um, Deutschtum and Judentum, when he, which he writes in 1915, where he talks about Herder, uh, there's an amazing passage in there where he says that it's Herder. The Jews, in fact, had more or less neglected the messianic tradition, and it's Herder who reminded them of the importance and revived it also for the Jewish tradition. I thought that was a very interesting point that he makes there uh, in talking about Herder. Um, but also, um, uh, I'm not familiar with any with that passage in the uh, religion of reason. It pr probably is there. It's just that I forgot. Um, but is it also does, does it occur in there, is, or is it more in the um, system of philosophy? In his or the second volume on ethics, is it more ethics of pure will? Yeah. So uh, uh, I think you you. You quote uh, one of the one of the most important theme for Cohen in the Jewish tradition is theme of machinism that comes from from Maimonides uh, and the influence from Maimonides to Cohen through many others authors. Uh, so I think. Uh, Someone can can inter can interpret this this uh, this idea of messianism as a secularization, as a demythologization, and uh, I think it is so. Uh, it was in the in the direction of the of the Wissenschaft des Judentums and of this of this. Uh, Reform, uh, new reform, Jewish uh, direction movement, uh, but I think also that uh, uh, for for Cohen it was also personally a mission. He he he, he feels that he has the heritage of a Ezekiel. Uh, of the prophet Ezekiel, because his Hebrew name was Ezekiel, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he feel as a mission for for uh, his uh, himself to to predicate this 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 value of Judaism in the European culture in the European culture, and this and it is. This is my opinion. This is the sense of this uh, of this essay, Deutschum und Judentum. This is very problematic because it was very uh, uh, very uh, pocket. Uh, 
few years, a uh, 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 few years, uh, uh, the, the word Nazism. Also, his perspective about uh, symbiosis between Judaism and Germany seems to be comics, uh, tragic and comics together. Mm. But, but in 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 uh, in fact, uh, it was an idea that the German culture and for coin German culture signify European culture. European culture is uh, uh, is the 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 results of two traditions, the Jewish traditions and the Greek traditions. And these two different traditions have a, a common, a common uh, uh, perspective, the reason, the universal reason. And so uh, Judaism in, the, in German culture is a critical memory of this heritage. And this is for Cohen important, tragic. Important. Thank you. So, Fabio, uh, please. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me again? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I thank you, uh, Professor Barash and Professor Andrea, for the wonderful lectures. And um, also, I would like to thank all the organizing committee of this uh, round table because uh, I'm not a new Kantian or a philosopher, so to say I'm a rather a liberal Lutheran theologian, so I'm like a spirit, uh, spirit amongst you. So uh, I would have some questions and comments and um, Regarding all um, the comprehension of history uh, in Wiedelband and also uh, in regards to the philosophy of religion of Cohen. And those questions are really important to me and to my personal research. So starting with Professor Barash, uh, it seems to me that in Wiedelband's constructions of history, uh, the a priori is not longer derived from a perception and illustrated in its traditional logical constituent as it is in Kant, but derived from the subject achievements of science among which the natural sciences given the common origin of modern philosophy and modern natural sciences from mathematics are relatively is accept, accepted by Kant's procedure, while the historical sciences, which have grown in a completely different philosophical climate, at least in the form of the German historical school uh, presupposed by Lotze, Diltai, and Winderband, are much more difficult to come to a unanimous a priori and quite uncritical concepts such as individuality and the structure which is brought up with it. But as soon as one proceeds in this way, with the natural sciences taking into account their, their constructive, constructive unitary concepts and next to it, uh, the completely different structured history the whole strictly unitary Kantian concept of the a priori developed from the uh, transcendental deduction begins to falter, it seems to me, in Windebad. It either becomes a series of different hypotheses and form presuppositions, which first have to be justified by their fertility as is the case with Georg Zimmel, uh, for instance, or it requires a phenomenological analysis of the structures of scientific instinct and involuntary vision as its own presupposition, as the uh, Edmund Husserl poses as a preparatory task before and transcendental logic. And even more than the a priori, 
the phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenalism of external and above all internal experience, which Kant in is inextricably related to, is shaken by all of it. Just all just as it belongs to the indiscussable prerequisites of empirical history that it grasps something of the absolute real in the movement of historical life and in the development of intellectual content. So in Vindemann's theory, the Kantian coupling of space and time and the simple phenomenality historical time cannot be maintained. Accordingly, Wildemann he has expressly given up both and finally answered the question of the possibility of simultaneously existence of human subjective forms of thought and absolute reality in the same act of cognition by referring to the doc doctrine of identity. In this sense, he even <coughs> speaks of a metaphysics of the spirit, which underlies every knowledge of historical development. With this, a connection with Leibniz, Schelling, Fichte, and Hegel, and finally with Lotze, is expressed with full consciousness, but also precisely for the sake, for the sake of history, Kantianism is fundamentally exceeded. And it is only through these this, this decisive dissolutions in detail that the combination of being and value, or the gegebenen uh, of gegebenen, of idea and growth becomes possible, which characterizes the transformation transformation of merely cognitive theoretical criticism into content-related cultural philosophy. So my question is, what's the relationship that we can construct be between Windelband's philo philosophical system and the idealist systems advanced by, amongst others, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel? Is Vinaban really an outsider when we consider the constellation of problems stemming from German ideas, idealism and the concept of constellation of problems is of course, is of course derived by, uh, from uh, Dieter Heinrich. Um, if not, if he's not like an outsider uh, of the constellation of the problems stem from German idealism, what are the difference and uh, approximations between Windebund and the classical German philosophy? So that's my question to Professor uh, Barash. Um, the, um, I think his relation to Hegel is most clear. I mean, he, it, he, he doesn't talk a great deal about Fichte or Schelling, but he does mention Hegel uh, quite a bit. And um, of course, he doesn't accept uh, Hegel's um, philosophy of history is very critical of this idea, precisely because the, the, the metaphysical dimension, the metaphysical reality of the development of, um, of the spirit as, um, as Hegel envisions it in, in the phenomenology and other writings, is something that he simply uh, cannot accept. But uh, what he does accept um, is the idea of an essential historicity um, of, of, of humanity and a historicity which is above all um, the historicity of, of reason and um, a, a historicity in which uh, reason in fact progresses in which it discovers um, and refines uh, its own uh, basic principles. Um, so I mean it's, it's, it's idealism but not uh, in the Hegelian sense. To answer, to say about the a priori, I think that's a very important question, a very difficult question in Lindelbund, um, because it's much more uh, difficult to um, uh, understand. But I think that uh, there is an a priori in all forms of concept formation, whether it's in the natural sciences or in the ideographic uh, historical sciences, and you can understand it in this way. If you look at Kant, I'm thinking of the, um, 
uh, Transcendental Analytic, where Kant asked at one point, what's the difference between the dream and reality? Um, what if, if in fact we constitute um, uh, experience according to the forms of space and time that we impose on it, which Mindelbaum will accept, this idea that in fact, if, if, uh, <coughs> the pure forms of experience are something that we lend to it uh, according to necessary and universal rules. Uh, the answer to the question, what distinguishes reality from a dream is that reality necessarily and universally conforms to certain rules. Um, and those rules are unchanging. Um, whereas in a dream, there are all sorts of incoherences that violate these principles and make, right. let us know that, um, that uh, they, are not, um, they are not real. Uh, Schopenhauer, this is a very important point because Schopenhauer in his um, essay on history, he says that history is the long dream of humanity. So what he's saying essentially is that in its reality, that history is so individual and so uh, composed of ungraspable uh, singular events and facts that you can't make it coherent in its, re its real objective being. So that what Bindelbaum has to do is to rescue a certain notion of the a priori, in other words, uh, of this um, uh, coherence of, uh, of judgment, uh, scientific judgment in history, uh, and to accord to it um, an a priori status, which he does. The answer that he would give to the question is that um, what distinguishes why is history not simply the dream of humanity? It's precisely because the, of this overarching coherence, this cohesion of different historical periods and this uh, ongoing continuity of rationality, which becomes ever more refined and in a, in a critical perspective over the long course of history, which begin this, uh, begins to recognize um, its um, ultimate grounding in, um, in fundamental principles that become ever more clear. All of this uh, indicates that there is a, an a priori basis. The cohesion that Kant talks about of universal and necessary principles is given by the overarching rationality of, uh, of the human world um, in history. So I think that that's a, an extremely important point. And this comes out in the theoretical world precisely in these theoretical relations to values because our possi the possibility of making objective judgments and saying that um, uh, in fact, uh, I'm able to reconstruct what, what Napoleon, what in the period of Napoleon, act, historical actors in the period thought to be valuable and what their values were, their singular values in that historical context. This is something that I can understand in its individuality and that 50 years from now, people will be able to read what I've written about it and say, yes, this is true, because the theoretical relation to values shows a certain cohesion over a period of time where this objectivity does not change. It's a, um, an objectivity which is anchored. It may be refined. It may, be, may find principles that make it ever deeper and ever better. But the essential uh, insight into these theoretical um, values that lend objectivity to our historical explanations, these, these um, operate according to uh, a priori principles that do not change over time in, in any essential way. So uh, it, would it be safe to say that Winneborn is trying to escape or avoid uh, the consequences of historicisms uh, as developed for, by, above all, Ernst Trelch and Oiken, uh, for instance, by referring to a concept of history which is internal to consciousness? That's a, that's a very important question. And um, um, in fact, he's constantly criticizing and resisting uh, in the preludium. He's constantly resisting and criticizing historicism on that basis. It's very important when you look at the, the internal development of the neo-Kantian movement to see that certain authors um, abandon 
Max Weber is the, is the case in point. The different, Max Weber is very much influenced by Windelband and Rickert, especially Rickert. Um, and um, he refers to him, as soon as he talks about objectivity, his essay on the objectivity of the sciences immediately invokes the name of, uh, of Rickert. I mean, Rickert's, this distinction that Rickert makes between um, theoretical relation to values and um, practical value judgments is something that Max Weber accepts directly uh, as it is. It inspires his own idea of objectivity, but the essential difference is that he did not accept the idea of some sort, some transcendent uh, postulate, this, this idea of a transcendent anchoring of, of values. He, he doesn't, uh, he sees this as being uh, unnecessary to the sciences and uh, not something that is useful um, for empirical science. And so I, this is a something of an argument between Rickert and Weber, but in general, um, on the principles of the science sciences, they are they are very close in their theoretical outlook, and Weber is very much influenced by. Um, there's a passage in Rickert's book on uh, Die Grenzen der Naturwissenschaftlichen Begriffsbildung, the limits of uh, concept formation in the natural natural sciences, in which he addresses the problem. He says, "What's the difference between Weber sociology and?" and my uh, conception of history. And we see that sociology uh, um, admits a greater degree of generality in its formation of, of types that distinguishes it from the individual concept formation of the historical sciences. So that there's a whole theory of the human sciences, the difference between sociology and history that, that Weber very much accepts. Um, that develops out of this, but the, the basic difference between them lies in their um, relation to the problem of uh, transcendent values, uh, just something Weber is not willing to acknowledge. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that Weber would have to stop because, like, being a socio sociology, uh, sociologist, uh, he would have to stop. And that was like the main question between Max Weber and Ernst Treuch. Uh, Treuch would be like, like yeah, uh, which go like much further in relation to uh, Bewusstseins, uh, Theoretische, and uh, uh, philosophy and so on. Uh, uh, but thank you very much, Professor Barsh, for, uh, for your answer. And now I would like to ask a question to Professor Andrea Poma. Um, so, um, I'm aware that Cohen's philosophy of religion um, has much to do with uh, especially uh, Protestant liberal theologies. He was like an avid reader of uh, Protestant uh, liberal theologies. And yesterday I asked to Professor Olivier um, the relationship, uh, the, uh, the status of religion in Cohen's uh, um, um, system. And he would refer to um, the concept of gefühl, feeling, which was like, uh, which is the ground, uh, ground concept for Shilayamaha, for instance, uh, construction of uh, the whole doctrine of uh, uh, theological doctrine or, or the uh, Glaubensleher, um, which is like a, a special form of a modern theology, con uh, theological construction. So um, my question would be like, uh, and a comment as well, uh, would have to do with uh, the status of the religious a priori as espoused by Treuch and also by Rudolf Otto, uh, empirical schematism, uh, which became uh, just among other possibilities uh, around the 1900, 1900s uh, for justifying religion and its general validity against the background of the process of self-differentiation of the system of sciences, of uh, this and system, as, as a result of the advance of social and cultural modernization 
in its process of self-differentiation into, into distinct subsystems, as Nicholas Luhmann describes, theology lost its self-claimed position as guardian of the monopoly of the cultivation of the religious field. The old forms of justification have thus lost their plausibility. Theology had to redefine its foundation from its own means, that is to say, from an exercise of interiorization of enlightened criticism as a moment of foundation of a concept of religion capable of responding to the conditions of possibility imposed by the cult of reason, uh, which is pretty much the case with Cohen, uh, philosopher of religion, uh, uh, in this case. So the uh, neo-Kantianism from uh, uh, the Southwest uh, Germany, as espoused, as espoused by the Windelband in his sketch of a philosopher of religion, namely uh, Das Heilige, published in 1902, subtract religion from the transcendental form, forms of consciousness, that is, thought, action, and feeling. Distinguishing it from these functions of consciousness in its transcendental legality, Windermann relates religion to the self-relationship of consciousness, which is, as such, transcendent. Through the antinomy between the norm normativity and empirical facts, facti facticity, which is linked to the realization of the th three faculties of consciousness, religious represents the unity of culture, that is, the sacred. For venerable religion is uh, as the non-derivative perception of the unity of norm and appearance of in consciousness, in consciousness, in transcendent life, what is essential is to, to live beyond experience, the awareness of belonging to a world of spiritual values, not being content with what is empirically real. In turn, the neo-Kantian Hermann Cohen from Marburg also, also took the tendency to attribute religion to ge general fun uh, consciousness and no longer to a, a specific a priori consciousness. In his study, the Begriff der Religion in System der the Philosophie, uh, published in 1915, Cohen separates religion from the three functions of consciousness in their transcendental legality and attributes them to the indiv individual realization of cultural consciousness. For Cohen, the religious idea of God represents the unit of culture as an idea. So my question is like uh, this whole idea of the, an idea of culture uh, represented by religion, uh, how would that be like developed within the uh, the framework of Cohen's philosophy of religion. Is it like um, an a, a priori structure? Is religion an a priori structure of reason, or is it only an idea? And by only, I mean not only, but also uh, an important and foundational idea uh, for the whole culture, for the unit of the whole culture. Uh, what, would be, what would be then the status of religion in his system of philosophy? And um, of course, uh, there are many questions regarding your paper as well, uh, in regards to the sacred and the sand, so to say, is to translate to English, uh, because that does not uh, go well with the biblical interpretation of monotheism and so on. So, but that's an, uh, a different question. But uh, my question is regarding the uh, the status of the philosophy of religion, especially of religion, in the construction of the unit or the postulated unit of culture in its totality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, your your contribution is a rich uh, themes that 
it's for me possible to 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 discuss all the points but i will only uh, say something about two themes the theme of uh, feeling in uh, in uh, in the relation between religion and philosophy and the theme of the place of the religion of reason in the system of call so as you say <coughs> in the in the uh, religion in system uh, the philosophy uh, there is three uh, three parts and the third part is dedicated to the this argument the relation between religion and aesthetics. Um, I wrote the uh, introduction to this volume of the Cohen works. And uh, when, I, when I studied for this, I reflected on a singularity. The, the part of, on the relation between uh, religion and logic, logics, and the part of the relation between religion and ethics are very positive. Cohen explained how, how, man, how many relations there are and important relations there are between religion and logic and religion and ethics. But the third part is completely negative. Cohen dedicated this part to uh, to uh, say what difference, what no relation there is between religion and aesthetics. Why? Why? So the, the history is complicated and uh, but also interesting. In this time, uh, Cohen was very, very um, preoccupied worry for the direction of Natop's thought. Because Schleiermacher was, in general, a very, very stark influence in the reflection about religion. And Natop was very deep influenced from Schleiermacher. So that he went more and more away from Steiermacher. Steiermacher wrote about the infinity of uh, the feeling of the infinity and not uh, write about the infinity of feeling that is a pot verstärkung of Steiermacher and that was very very problematic for Cole and in this moment he was more interested to signify the difference, the difference between uh, religion and aesthetics, because there was there was the risk to unify them in the direction of Schleiermacher and NATO. In the religion of reason, uh, the situation is is changed. He has no more this stark worry in in front to NATO. And there is many reflection about the aesthetic dimension of the religion and the feeling, feeling dimension of the religion. So this is only a part of the, of the answer. The, the other thing about the, the, the place of the religion in, in front of the system, many opinions are uh, say. Someone says, this is the Rosenzweig thesis, that with the religion of reason, Cohen changed his philosophy in the direction of an, an existential philosophy, of the Neues Denken, of other, I, I think uh, Rosenzweig say from himself, uh, on, on himself and not on, on Cohen. Cohen didn't change his, his doubt in the religion of reason. 
Someone says that the religion, the religion of reason is the fourth and final part of the system. But in my opinion, that this is also wrong. Uh, I think it it was it is uh, it is right what uh, Rosenfeld says that in the first time, Cohen talked to the aesthetic as the third and finished part of the system, and this is an important theme in the aesthetic because it says that the the the, the, the beauty is the realization, the realization of the unity of logic and ethics. That is the realization of the system. But what is the limit of this realization? It is the realization in the figure, in a figure, not in an idea. So he, he saw that the aesthetic cannot be the, the complete the the comp the finish of the, the of the system, and we think he talked from from the logic as a psychology as a, a forty part and complete com complement of the system, but he, he didn't wrote this psychology, but I didn't I didn't wrote anywhere that religion or reason was a part of the system. Religion or reason is not a part of the system. My opinion, but this is only, this is only few wo words I, I would, I, I, should, I should make more and more reflection. It is no a part of the system, is another perspective on, on the system, is another perspective on the system. From the unique uniqueness of God, all the system of logic, ethics, aesthetics, psychology can be shown in another perspective. But it's another another thing about uh, it's not a part of the system. Then you have made many many other interesting reflections, but I cannot answer. To uh, we can discuss those those mainly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Perman. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, I'll ask to Evandro, uh, if you could state your, uh, your question, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. <coughs> Good evening. Professors and my colleagues. And uh, First of all, I'd like uh, to thank the invitation to take part in this uh, colloquium on neocantism. Yeah, like I said uh, before, um, I'm uh, Franz Brentano's ethical researcher, and for me, it's a very, very interesting opportunity to, to take part uh, in a conference with um, neocantism, but uh, it's more it's interesting, at, it's so interesting at all to to uh, talk about papers from Professor Andrea Poman because his paper is I had the opportunity to read this paper in advance and uh, it's so interesting for us especially in Brazil at this moment, political moment, but uh, it's so interesting at all for, for us uh, because the purpose of the papers and, and it's, uh, it's uh, a way to discuss with a lot of anthropological interpretation of religion here in Brazil. Then uh, I would make uh, just a question about, uh, about the paper and about the, for the principal argument, but I would like only to say two or three words um, 
about our culture and about uh, our, the conception of religion here in Brazil maybe can be interesting for Professor Poma. And, uh, and, but uh, maybe it's not new for the others. Um, at first, I would like to point out that here, of, of course, uh, everybody know, uh, it's a, uh, a country where we speak uh, Portuguese languages of uh, European language, and in this way, we are in the here of the Western. But we have uh, almost 200 languages here in Brazil that are uh, speak by uh, natives, native uh, uh, native peoples, and uh, this this almost 200 languages um, preserve their culture and especially their religion. Then we are talking about a country where we can find almost 200 kinds of religion, but, but maybe it's more because we can define as uh, like a multicultural country uh, because we uh, uh, receive our religion from uh, all the world and uh, Buddhism and agnosticism, like Professor Poma pointed out, and uh, all kind of Christianism, but uh, Judaism, of course, uh, and uh, my, but my point here is uh, that uh, when do you, we think about language uh, and religion, and you take uh, some uh, consideration about hermeneutics, then maybe we have a, a, a question to, to maybe we have a difficult. Uh, to accept some uh, solution that can be pointed out uh, in a perspective of universalization. Maybe not, but, but uh, the fact here in this moment is that uh, we can think about a country where uh, the pluralism, uh, religious pluralism is the point. Uh, uh, in this way, I will. I I, I think uh, that uh, you can uh, understand um, my question uh, because I think uh, that your your interpretation for Cohen may be lead with this this problem, and I think this is the same problem uh, that uh, Professor Ducio from Mexico think about, and we think about. And and you you and you have uh, uh, some theoretical way of think about this problem. The the famous uh, solutions we can find in the theology of libertas libertation uh, from Professor Ducio that uh, think and that the point is. Uh, not give up from universality of the ethical proposal, ethical principle, uh, but in the same time, you need, like uh, your interpretation uh, point out, you need, or coin point out, you need uh, recognize the concrete order in the heart of uh, possibility of universalization. Yes, this is in the front of a, a theoretical point. Maybe it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, obvious. But when you think about uh, an country like Brazil or uh, the multiculturalism country, the, the kind of multicultural country that we have, that we have in South America, and this question become more important. And uh, so, uh, under this uh, background, uh, I, will, I will return to the consideration about some points of your papers, and that for me was very, very interesting. And uh, 
uh, where I think you uh, you uh, try to develop, de develop some uh, pos possible solution. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, in uh, it's interest for me in, in in your paper is is this uh, uh, this paper explicitly uh, analyze the relation between uh, monotheist and religion. But uh, Ari analyzed uh, the ethical eth ethics theory from the universal perspective, and uh, maybe it's possible, or oh, we need to put uh, oh, oh, or start a discussion with the colonial perspective. Uh, in this sense, I will try. I will try use. Uh, Two quotation from uh, Bononet. Was Bononet offered in his book uh, Herman Cohen Kantian Philosophy Religion two roads of to think about the concrete other. It's a uh, it's an interesting uh, quotation. In the, in, the, in the first quotation, Bononet uh, said that where road to take uh, compassion to others. Uh, towards the concrete orders, which complete, which, which is complete. A moment, please. Where where road to take compassion towards the concrete order, which is complementary to an ethic of universal respect, as its point of departure, and a grace that an attitude of compassion to recognize of order as a genuine individual, the supposed and distinctive religion's conscience. And second the quotation from Bononet, he said, the other road is inspired by Kant wrestling with the problem of rem removal of moral guilt in religion. Uh, in his uh, famous, in Kant's famous books, religion uh, is in uh, limits of uh, reason alone and uh, center around the question to guide the liberation for guilt. Then, uh, the, the problem and the question that I'd like to point out uh, lead me to consider the controversy surrounding the limit of Kant enlightenment, enlightenment ethics even in light of uh, Hegel's criticism. Uh, from the point of the view of the, the Hegel's criticism, even if, uh, if, if the imperative category from, from Kant had a formal power of to impose the moral criteria, the problem was that uh, formalization was uh, empty and uh, cannot, in fact, develop moral in the culture. Well, uh, and when the check the anthropology of Kant, we can find a lot of example that we can uh, today uh, uh, criticize at a no Christian, for example, no Christian, uh, because uh, the out consideration for Kant about people out of Europe in th in this uh, anthropological uh, book, and and it's a split violation of the second formulation of categorical imperative. Well, what I can to do is uh, point out some perspective in Kant's philosophy to understand how possible it is uh, to go from Kant to Cohen and find in Cohen and solution, uh, like 
uh, you develop in your text, but find input and solution uh, for some limitation of Kant in categorical imperative. So, well, in this way, my question is that how far from, from Kant, Kant's ethics can Cohen messianic ethics advance by taking as its starting point compassion toward the concrete other? Or how close or how far is compassion towards the concrete other, not only for the peoples of different cultures and religion, but also for uh, non human beings? Uh, like animals and another beings, and uh, this is my my my, my question: How is uh, how can uh, uh, Cohen uh, offer a solution for the formalism of uh, uh, Kantian ethics, and how this solution can uh, can uh, offer space for the concrete others? But uh, thinking concrete others, not only like a person, but uh, even like an, uh, other beings, uh, no human uh, persons, like animals, for example. Did you finish? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> you, you. Uh, about the problem that is for me one of the most important and it was the theme of my last lesson at the university that will be published uh, in this time it was uh, exactly the foundation of the pluralism in a in, the, in a Kantian deontological ethics. And that was, that was my thesis, that only an absolutely rigorously deontological ethics can found a, a real and authentic pluralism. That the, the opposition, the real opposition is not, as man says, between absolutism and pluralism in the ethics, where, where absolutism signify also totalitarianism or imperialism, and pluralism say, uh, signifies, signifies also relativism. That is false. The real opposition is between pluralism and relativism. These are the real opposites. Real relativism is the opposite of pluralism. Why? Because what characterizes the pluralism is the legitimacy, legit, legitimacy of many different positions. This, the, the key word is legitimacy in the relativism all the positions are possible because never, uh, no one of them are legitimate. There is no uh, legitimate principle. So all is equal because all is no legitimate. But in pluralism, the key word is legitimacy. A pluralistic so society or culture is a society or culture that recognizes that many different positions are legitimate, are legitimate. And for this, we need a principle of legitimation. And this principle of legitimation can, must be an absolute principle, but not a dogmatic and totalitarian principle. The, an absolute principle, not dogmatic, not totalitarian, signifies a former principle. A former principle, as Kant said. 
the categorical imperative is not the ethic of Kant. It's the foundation of the ethic of Kant. That's different. That's different. Without this uh, absolute formal foundation, we cannot legitimize the different positions. But you must, you must uh, be convinced that we are, we must, th we must think not in the thought of the, of identity. Absolute is not identical identical. Absolute is not imperialistic identical. We must think in the thought of the differences, where the principle, the original principle is not the identity, but the differences. In this way of thinking, a formal, an absolute formal principle is necessary to legitimate the different position, positions in a pluralistic society and culture. And th this is my opinion. This is the, the authentic pluralism that is the opposite of relativism. And what is the, the discrimination between a legitimate and unlegitimate uh, position, you humanness, humanity, the humanness, humanness is a is not a virtue, is not an ethical category. Human it can be also some something at the uh, moral bad, but it's human. We say also in popular scene, we say that's human, and we say for other things this anti-human, this anti-human. Human, that's right coin. Humanness, humanity, is the relation with the other before any judgment, before any judgment. So humanness is not a, an ethical category, is an absolute idea that opened the space for the possibility of pluralistic ethics and give them the direction. Many different ethic way to live and to be are possible and legitimate, but they must be in the, in the limits of the humanness. The anti-humanness, they are not legitimate. This is the idea of the pluralism, in my opinion. And that's the opposite, the opposite of relative. That's a very interesting for me, a very thin. Thank you that you that you introduced it. Well, th thank you very much, Professor. Uh, uh, just mo one more question. Uh, in this way, in this uh, uh, concept of humanity that is open, uh, can we think about uh, it's uh, possible to 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 converge? A lot of culture where the base is uh, the opposite. Uh, the base is the uh, uh, sacred and profane, because uh, oh, cool. we can yeah, we can integrate communities that are using uh, that are based in religion, mythical religion, but. Uh, uh, in order to think about humanity at all? Yeah, I think not only that uh, the sacred can enter in this, in this space of the pluralism, but we need it because the religions of the sacred are the, the way to trade with the sacred. And the sacred is a reality also in our society. Uh, also in our, in our individual life. And we have no other way to trade the sacred as the way that this, the cultures of the sacred, also the psychoanalysis, for example, uh, learned to, uh, to trade it. Only we must not, uh, uh, we must not mix, mix 
uh, the, the cultures of the sacred and the monotheism. And, and it is for this that in my text, but I repeat it in, in my in my book on the postmodernism, I say I suggest that we could we should no more say that monotheism, Jewish and Christian monotheism, is a religion. It, it's not a religion. Religion is the religion of the sacred, of the sacred. Uh, monotheism is the tradition, tradition of the saint. It's it's a question of word, but the word uh, perhaps uh, make the, 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 the situation clearer. Say that monotheism is a religion is to confound the, 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 the things, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Professor. It's so clear. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Poma. I think it was wonderful, and we're approaching the end of uh, this talk, I think. Uh, I don't know if, if you, uh, Professor Barish and Professor Pomo, has uh, something something you, you want to say to us, and uh, so we're uh, langsam uh, to the end of, of this talk. Uh, so, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for this very stimulating uh, session. I very much liked uh, Professor Poma's last uh, comments on uh, the difference between pluralism and relativism. It's a very important point. Um, and I hope we'll continue our collaboration. Thank you very much. I thank you also, you all very much. I'm, I'm glad to, to see a new Professor Barash, I hope we, we have the possibility to, to meet us uh, another way, another way. And thank you to all you, and I hope also to be connected with you the, through uh, maze and through, and we can continue our discussion and our common reflection. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So I have just uh, a few words of thank you for you guys. So there is no doubt that this afternoon was very, very fruitful, I think. The exchange and learning with Professor Barrett and Palma was excellent for us. So therefore, I would like to thank you and publish for your contribution in our volume and to your contribution in our, in our colloquium. And as Professor Beresh says and Professor Poma, I hope sincerely that we continue to share and work together. So thank you very much in the, for us, it, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.